Okay. Yeah, so we're, it looks like we're looking for multi-loop circuits all the way up to probably flat areas, but it'll be very basic stuff. Flat areas, you'll see, are pretty easy. It's just the image distance is equal to the object distance, and that'll be the form of the end of all reflection. Uh, where do you feel the weakest? What do you want to look at first? Multi-loops? Maybe some multi-loops? Good. All right. I had this uh, packet that I handed out, or that I sent out. And by the way, are any of you here that did that printed the packet that won it back? That's Abby, Haley, no, Emily. All right. Um, so I brought this. We've been working on this at uh, different at the help session. So I'll skip over the ones that we've done already, and we'll look at some others. There's a bunch, right? So. You're going to have one like number six, where you have to figure out which equation is correct. Now, remember, there are a few conventions that you need to remember when you're applying the loop rule, that if I'm going with a battery from high to low potential, that the change in potential in that one is going to equal to negative E. That is, if I'm going from this direction, go down, I lose energy when I go from the high to low potential in that direction. Remember with the batteries, the direction of the current doesn't matter. It's just what direction am I going across the battery. And then if you go the opposite direction, then you gain energy. Now as you're going across a resistor, let me draw that. If you go in this direction, I come along, I gain energy as I go from low to high potential. So delta V is equal to positive EMF. It's, if it's 10 volts, it's positive 10. Uh, and then for resistors, if I'm going against with the current, that is if the current is in this direction and I'm going in that direction, I have a negative IR. That's normal for resistors. If I'm going against the current, it's positive IR. So when you're looking at one light number six, what you want to do is go one by one through the options and look at the first couple of things. So here I have four minus two I one. So I know then that I'm starting here and going in that direction, all right? Then also recognize that my currents, that I have three currents in this. I have this current, that's I1. I have this current, that's I2. And then I also have this current, that's I3 three different currents between the junctions. So 4 minus 2I1, is that correct so far? I'm going with the current through the resistor, so it should be negative 2. Um, <coughs> minus 12, so I'm continuing on in this direction. It should be minus 12 because I'm going from high to low potential, so it looks like this scenario up here. And then I'm going against the current through the 3 ohm resistor, so that should be positive 3I3. So this one is not correct. I'm going to do the same thing for the next one. Minus 4, minus I2. But notice there when I'm doing that, that I'm actually now starting here and going in this direction. I looked at the first two elements, the 4 and the 1 ohm. Minus 4, that's okay so far. Minus 1I2, I'm going with the current. The arrow is pointing down. Minus 1I2, it should be plus 5 next, that's what I got. And then plus 2I1, is that correct, the 2I1, plus 2I1? It is correct, because I'm going against the current. So the answer then is going to be B. And then you can go through the other C and D and show whether or not they're correct. With the... Um, With the junction rule, when you're applying the junction, like option D here, you pick a junction and you ask, what are the incoming currents? What are the outgoing currents? What are my outgoing currents in this junction? No outgoing currents. They're all incoming. I1, I2, and I3 are all going into that junction. So I know that's not right. And then C is not correct either, but B is the right one there. Then you're going to also have a calculation. So here... If I3 is 2 amps, what is the magnitude and direction of I2? So I can make these simple mathematically in a couple of ways. I can give you one of the currents, and that's what I've done here. Or I can give you a circuit that's missing a resistor in one of the loops. And either one of those ways will make it easy. And here, 
not easy, but the math is a little simpler. Right, you still have to do the same procedure. Okay, so if I3 is 2 amps, what is the magnitude and direction of I2? And then the trick here is to figure out what loop am I going to use. Well, if I know I3 and I want to know I2, I'm going to use the right loop. I'll use the right loop because I know the most information about that. So let's write an equation for that one. I'll start right here. It doesn't really matter where I start. It doesn't matter the direction I go. I just decided I'm going to start right there. And so I say minus 1i2, that's just minus i2, plus 5, minus 12, plus 3i3, and that's all equal to 0. i3 is equal to 2 amps, and then I solve for i2. Negative i2, uh, my, uh, let's see, minus 7 plus 6, minus 1 equals 0. So I2 is equal to 1 amp. Uh, I2 is 1 amp. So I can get rid of B and D. If I solve this for I2, I actually get that I2 is equal to negative 1 amp. So which answer is it going to be? Is it going to be up or down? Well, what is I2 listed as here in the middle? Right here it's listed as down. So what's the answer going to be? Is it up or down? It's going to be up. Right. The negative means that I've chosen the direction for that current incorrectly. And so I'm going to take the opposite of the number that I've got. You're going to see something like that. Let's see if I can find one that's a little bit different. But you'll definitely see a sequence of two questions like this. So don't be shocked by that. It'll probably be the first question on the test. Which of these is the correct equation? And then calculate what is the current. Um, Let's do this one, number 24. This one is made simpler because I'm missing a resistor on this right-hand side. And so I can, I want to know here what is I2, what is the current in this branch, and so which loop am I going to use? Which loop am I going to use? I can use the left loop, I can use the big loop, or I can use the right loop. What do y'all think? Which am I going to use? I'm going to use the right loop. Right. So I'm going to write an equation for the right loop. Let me step you through this first and I'll write it down. I'll have minus 2i2 plus 4 and minus 8. That's all there is. All right. And I come back to the beginning. I get minus 2i2 plus 4 minus 8. That's all equal to 0. Uh, it's minus 4. Or I2 is equal to negative 2. Yeah, I2 is equal to negative 2. And so now, the answer, well, it can only be A. But notice that it's up, and I got it to be negative here, so it's just opposite what I had here. Alrighty? You're going to have it. You need to know those four conventions. Is the potential positive or negative across these resistors? And it, it's R the battery, and so it's four conditions. If I'm going with the current across the resistor, positive or negative? Negative, you're right. If I'm going against the current, which is sort of not the normal way for resistors, but if I'm going against the current, what is that? It's positive. On a battery, if I'm going from little to big, like this, what is, if I'm going in that direction from low to high potential, positive or negative? You're right. If I'm going from big to small, what is that? Negative. That's all you got to know. Right? That's all you got to know. And you apply your loop rule and you apply your junction rule. All right, I know it seems a little scary, but it, that's really it. And then you apply those rules. Let's look at the junction rule. There was a problem here that was a little bit different, but I, I just I want to go over That way, if you see something like it on the test, you won't be freaking out about it. Oh, here it is, number 25. Here I have this multi-loop circuit has more than two loops. It actually has, gosh, one, two, three, four, five. It has like five or six distinct loops. Uh, it has, instead of just two junctions, it has one, two, 
three, four junctions. And I want to write what is the, which of these is the correct equation. Just like we did before, you start with each one. I1 minus I2 equal I3. Well, let's see, that's going to involve this junction. And in that junction, it should be I1 equals I2 plus I3. Right, I1 is going in. Oh, no, 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 I did that wrong. I1 plus I2 equals I3. I1 and I2 are going in. I3 is going out. So this is not right. It could be made right by putting a positive between I1 and I2. I3 plus I6 is equal to I4. That would be this junction right here. What are the incoming currents? I3 is going in. What else? I6 and I4. So all three of those are going in. So really to write this correctly, I would have it all three of those are equal to zero. I2 plus I6 equals I5. That would be this junction right here in the middle. Uh, and the junction rule for that one should be I5 equal, hey, that looks like a winner to me. I5 is my incoming current. I2 and I6 are outgoing, so it should be I5 equals I2 plus I6. But that's what we have written right here. So you could see a question like that. You will see a question like that applying the junction rule, okay, where you look at each individual junction and ask yourself, what are the incoming currents and what are the outgoing currents? Definitely you'll see a question like that. That's the most complicated. There are some that are simpler than that. Uh, when I look at these, like when I looked at this one, I saw I2, I6, and I5. And the only junction that includes all three of those currents is this junction. Uh, because I5 is coming in, I2 is going out, and I6 is going out. But looks like uh, this junction only includes I2, I1, and I3. So I know it's not that junction. This junction includes I5, I1, and I4. So I just look for the junction that has those currents either going into or coming out of that particular junction. Kind of like what we did for the loop rule. I look for the, the currents or the voltages or the resistors that are involved in that loop, and it helps me identify what the loop is, or in this case, the junction. It's a good question, and it, it will come with practice. I think it's there already. I, I think we know how to do it. But uh, as always, when I test, practice makes it go a lot smoother on the test. If you go into the test and you're freaking out just a little bit, I understand I hate taking tests. I hate it. Because I feel like I forget about half of what I learned when I walk in the door. Right? Y'all feel that way? No, you don't ever feel that way? <laughs> all right. I feel that way all the time when I take a test. But practice, that helps. That helps a lot. Um, anything else on multi-loops? I'm going to look at some RC, RC. You know, with the RC, like I said, there are a couple of things that I want you to know how to do. And just not really just be familiar with decay and growth functions. And then also being able to solve for the charge, voltage, or current. You might also have to solve for the time. And we'll do all of those. So, boom, this is a good example. I want you to be able to identify the decay or growth function that for the charge, voltage, or current for a given thing, for a given uh, scenario. I'll tell you what it is. Uh, this one is in the problem. I'll tell you what the scenario is. This is a capacitor discharging. So it's a discharging capacitor. And I want to know what is the voltage versus time. First of all, the decay or growth function is either A or B. So you're never going to have anything like that. Right? And then I can look at my equation sheet. Go back to my equation sheet. Where is it? Right here. Look at all the equations that we have. Now we're looking for the voltage of a discharging capacitor. And so that's going to be this one right here. Well, I don't have my pen there. But anyway, I'm looking here at the E minus T over RC. That is a growth or decay? 
That's a decay function. Very good. I know that because the e to the minus t over rc, this thing's always going to go to zero. As t gets bigger, this thing always goes to zero. And if I put that zero behind a one, then that now becomes a growth function. So in fact, my charging capacitor, the charge on a charging capacitor is the only thing that will ever look like a growth function or the potential on a charging capacitor. Everything else is a decay function. Uh, so on this case, I'm looking for the, what was it? The voltage on a discharging capacitor. Voltage on discharging, that's right here. So that's a decay function. And so it is going to look like A. This is the E to the minus T over RC. And that's the answer. Or this is the 1 minus E to the minus T over RC. If it was a voltage or charge of a charging capacitor, it would be B. Don't memorize it. Just look at the equations and remember which one looks like which. Remember that E to the minus T over RC always goes to zero. So that means that this function, as it decays, will approach zero. And this function will approach one. Or it will approach the maximum value of Q or B or Q or B. Alrighty, um, let's do one of the calculations. There could be a couple different calculations related to the time constant. For example, right here, it says the time constant is one second. Just realize that, you know, the time constant, that is tau, and it's equal to R times C. If the time constant is one second, that's going to be 10 mega ohm times uh, the capacitance. If you're uncertain, always go to SI units. So I will do that here. One second equals 10 times 10 to the 6 ohms times my capacitance. That's 1 over 10 times 10 to the minus 6, or 10 to the 6 equals my capacitance. That's going to be 0.1. That's 1 over 10 times 10 to the minus 6 farads. This is my capacitance, but it's given in microfarads, so it's going to be C. It looks like on this problem, I actually had, I don't do this, but this is kind of mean. It was a mean, but I have another answer that's identical except for the units. Uh, but I won't do that to you. Trust me. Seriously, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to mix up units for an answer because it's a little less easy. Okay, so you could see something like that. I could also ask you how much time does it take to fully charge or discharge a capacitor? What you do in that case is you calculate the what? the time constant, but then what do you do to the time constant? Right, you increase it by, you multiply it times 10. It takes 10 time constants to fully charge or fully discharge a capacitor. The time constant is really just a characteristic time. It's the time, I think it's like 30% charge or discharge. So you need 10 time constants. Let's see if there's an example of that. Oh, like number 40 here. It asks, after 25 seconds, has the capacitor fully charged? Well, first you need to figure out what is tau. That's 3 mega ohm times 2 microfarad. You could convert those to SI units, and that would not be incorrect. But look, mega and micro, they cancel out. Because mega is 10 to the positive 6, micro is 10 to the minus 6. Almost always have it that way. Sort of in life, that's how these RC circuits usually are with mega micro ohm capacitors, uh, but it also just makes the math a little easier. So tau is six seconds. So is it discharged or is it charged after 25 seconds? No, it takes how long to, to charge? How many? No, I have uh, six seconds as my time constant. So how long does it take to fully charge? Well, that's how many time constants? 10. And one time constant is 6 seconds. So it's like 60 seconds. Right. Okay? So not hard, but unless you don't know how to do it. And then it's, you know, you just have to know how to do it, right? So let's look at one other problem. Um, number 37 here. It's another type of problem. And you'll probably see one of each of these, honestly. One that has just to do with the time constant. One that has to do with identifying the graph, and then one that has to do with finding the charge at a particular time. Just 
can you identify all the variables that are at play and can you use this exponential function make sure you can do this in your calculator okay because you might not have used that e button very much so i want to know the charge first ask myself is this charging or discharging well since it says after the switch is closed that means that you engaged the circuit you started putting charge onto that capacitor so I look back at my equation sheet. It's a charging capacitor. I want to know the charge. So I'm using this, the, the, that growth function. So I say Q equals big Q times 1 minus E to the minus T over RC. And I solve for Q. Now big Q is the maximum charge. Q is equal to CV. 5 times 20 or 100 microcoulombs so this is going to be 100 times 1 minus e to the minus uh, t is 10 seconds and rc the time constant is equal to 2 times 5 or 10 seconds so negative 10 over 10 and then that is uh, i think it's 37 i think is the answer if i verify that for me Where are the answers? Did I put the answers on here? It is 37. Oh, yeah, okay, 63. So 63 is the right answer. Okay. After 10 seconds, that's what the charge is. Just make sure that you can do that in your calculator. If you can't come see me, I'll take 15 to 5 minutes. Okay. The one thing that is a little more complicated, and you may or may not have this, probably not, but I could put it on there, is calculating the time. And if you have to do that, I would give you the charge. So let's, um, let me just, so for example, I would give you, say, that Q is equal to 10 microcoulombs, let's say R is 1 mega ohm, uh, C is 2 microfarads, and I want to know what is the time, and then let's say that big Q is 100 microcoulombs, and it's uh, discharging. I just want to show you the math right quick. So Q I know is equal to big Q times E to the minus T over RC. This is uh, 10 microcoulombs equals 100 microcoulombs times e to the minus t. Rc is the product of this, so over 2. And you would solve that for t. Uh, you do 10 divided by 100 is 0.1 equals e to the minus t over 2. And then you do the natural log of both sides. That's really the tricky part if you don't know how to do that. But once you do the natural log of 0.1, that's just a number. It's a negative number. These two, nat this natural log cancels out that exponential. And then you would solve that for t. So I don't know what the natural log of 0.1 is, but it's equal to negative t over 2. Emily, you got your calculator. What's the natural log of 0.1? Uh, 1 over 2. Negative 2.3. And then, uh, so t would equal to positive 4.6 seconds. That's how you do that, just taking the natural log of your exponential. Those are the only problems that you'll encounter. Those are probably all, like, you will encounter each of those problems. There's not a lot of secrets on this. You're going to have a multi loop circuit. You're going to have to find the, the proper, proper equation. You're going to have to solve for a current. You're probably going to see a junction rule problem where you take out the correct junction rule, or you apply the junction rule for it to find an unknown current. Like where I give you two current, and you have to apply it to find uh, third term. Then you're going to have to identify the graphs for an RC charging or discharging circuit. You're going to have to probably do something with the time constant, figure out the time to completely charge or discharge the circuit, or given that time, figure out what is R or C in the circuit. And then uh, something like this or one of the others where you figure out the charge at a particular time, the voltage or the current at a particular time, or given a known charge, Determine what is the time, like we did here. 
All of them give me a point. Every single one of them. Okay? Y'all don't want to see words, though. You look all right. Like, you look excited about it. Are you excited? The opportunity to excel. So, like, so the bullying is trying to be part of the Oh no, this is, uh, what would be the fully discharge? This is the time when it has 10 microprograms. The fully discharge is you have to figure out what is your time constant, and it's going to be 1 times 2, or 2 seconds. And so what's the time to fully discharge this circuit? It's going to be 20. And the time constant is 2 seconds, so it takes twice, or 10 times the time constant, or 20 seconds. All right. How y'all in right hand rule business? Want a little primer on it? Oh, well, there are three applications of the right hand rule. Two of them are practically identical. So uh, let me just recap that. Three applications. The first is that F equal QVB business. We let our fingers go in the direction of V. We let this uh, fold or come out of your palm or however you want to think about that. And then this is your thumb. And so, for example, if V is in this direction and V is in that direction, I let my fingers and my right hand go in the direction of V. It can go in any direction like this. I don't know. But because the magnetic field is as it is, it has to go like this where my fingers fold into it. And so the force is upward. The force is upward like that. Uh, we can't have to work backwards. So say, for example, I give you the force, and I tell you the velocity. You say out of the page, what magnetic field has caused this? Well, I can start with my V, and then my force, my thumb is going the direction of the force, but V is coming out of the page. That means the magnetic field is coming in this direction, All right, coming to the right. So the magnetic field in this case is to the right. We could also see some like we did uh, where you have, say, a stream of particles and they move like that. And I ask you what magnetic field has caused that. Well, try to take this back to what we've seen already, that my velocity vector is initially in this direction and my force vector is in that direction. And so then my magnetic field has to be into the page, right? Because V is to the right, my thumb has to be oriented upwards, and so my magnetic field is into the page. So you can see any one of those, this is like in a mass spectrometer. Okay, the second application is identical, right? Where if I have, say, a wire in this direction, a magnetic field in that direction, then the force on that is upwards. This is exactly like this scenario. They're identical. The only thing is, you know, the wire represents the velocity. Uh, again, as I said, the current isn't really a vector point, it's a scalar quantity. But we'll sort of think like that and not imagine that it's a vector quantity. Current in that direction, magnetic field into the page. Our force vector is upwards. So all that works the same. The third application is uh, for a long straight wire. You really only have four scenarios that you can encounter with this. A wire that's going up, a wire that's going down, a wire into the page or out of the page. Or you could have the wire on the side, but it's a lot like this. Imagine this is your wire, the current's going up, my magnetic field, let my thumb go in the direction of the current, magnetic field wraps around into the page, out of the page. So into the page over here, out of the page over here. Similarly over here, thumb down, into the page, out of the page. Into the page on the left hand side, out of the page on the right hand side. Isn't that right? Yeah, that's right. And then for these other two here, they're either going to be clockwise or counterclockwise. Which is this 
clockwise or counterclockwise? Counterclockwise. Yeah, so uh, this one is going to be counterclockwise. And then this other one is going to be clockwise. Into the page, see how my fingers wrap around. Uh, we did some of these in class, so what is the magnetic field, say, at a point up here, at point P? Well, due to each of these, the one on the left, the magnetic field is going to be tangent to that circle, so it's going to be up and in that direction. And the one on the right is going to be up and in that direction. And so the net magnetic field will look like that. You could very much encounter, you probably will, and see one of these problems where I give you two wires and ask you at a particular point, what is the, mag the direction of the magnetic field? So we can calculate these forces here or here with our QVB or our ILB, right? And then we can also calculate the magnetic field. That's that mu naught I over 2 pi R business that we saw. Make sure you look at your equation sheet. You need to know it pretty well. You don't need to memorize these, but you do need to know what they mean. This is how I calculate the forces, QVB, ILB. These other things are for the torque on a loop of wire. Uh, and then, uh, where is it? This is the magnetic field due to a long straight wire. And then this is our magnetic field of our solenoid, the loop of wire. Remember how do we tell those apart? There's a pi difference, but there's also a n difference. And the n is for the loop of wire. Because it always, it will always have more than one turn of wire. It just doesn't make sense to have a loop of one turn. Okay? What else? Yeah, let's see. So uh, there's some in this handout. And you're going to see some of those, of course. Students don't usually have a whole lot of problem with that, but you know, it's one of those things where it's like if you don't know how to do it, then it's hard. Goodness, where are they? Did I put any in this? I don't know. I don't think I put any. I guess it was just all right-hand rule. But if we look back at the old test, we'll certainly find some there. You'll see household circuits too, okay? So make sure that you can do household circuits. I have to wait for my computer. It's thinking. It doesn't like these PDFs for some reason. What about this number one while we're looking at this, while we're waiting? Which of these is constant for appliances in your home? Voltage, current, power, or resistance? Which one or more than one of those is constant? What, Mackenzie? Voltage is right. That's the only thing that's constant, right? Power can change, current can change, resistance can change, but the voltage is always going to be the same. It's always going to be that 120. Okay, here we go. So, you know, you're not going to see much, much more complicated than this. I have a two coulomb charge traveling at six meters per second, a magnetic field that's orthogonal, perpendicular, so theta is 90 degrees, and the magnetic field has a magnitude of three Tesla. So that's Q, that's V, that's B. I want to know the force, F equals QVB. Uh, I want to know what F is, two coulombs. V is 6 meters per second, and B is 3 Tesla, 12, that's 36 Newtons. All right, 
you'll see something like that. Now you might see a more complicated problem. Like for example, we worked some of those with uh, electric fields and figuring out how do those balance with the electric fields. Let's see if I can see one of those. Might not be one on this one. No, it doesn't look like there's one on this one. Um, here's another calculation. I have a current in a circular loop. It has 10,000 turns of wire. All right, so this is my I. This is my N, the number of turns. This is my radius. And I want to know what is the magnetic field. I would look back at my equation sheet. I'm going to look at this last one, the N mu naught I over 2R. I know it's that one just because it has N, a number of turns. So N mu naught I over 2R. So that's uh, 10,000. Mu naught is 4 pi times 10 to the minus 7. That's on your equation sheet. Uh, I is 30 amps divided by 2R, or 0.2. So, oh, what is that? Four times 30 is 120. I don't know what that is. Do I know what that answer is? What do you got? Get some of those others. Here's one like the the um, elect the electric force and the magnetic force cancel out. In those cases, what you have to do. In those cases, when you have electric forces. You have to remember that the electric force is equal to Q times E. That's on your equation sheet, but you have to look back. It's in chapter 1. And then the uh, magnetic force is QVB. And you might have to do something with that, where you're comparing the electric force and the magnetic force. So I would go back and just remind yourself of this relationship. That's on your equation sheet, but it looks a little bit different. It's that uh, E is equal to F over Q. But make sure that you realize that often we'll use magnetic and electric fields together. Right? Y'all do that? Use magnetic and electric fields to guide a particle along a certain path or, or to, to isolate it. So you set these to be equal in that case where your electric and your magnetic fields are equal. Alrighty? Let's see. While we're here, let's just look a little bit ahead and look at some of the stuff that you'll see for um, light. Reflection and refraction. I'm just going to do about five more minutes. Is that okay? I have another interview at four. So we'll have fun. Is that okay? I appreciate y'all coming out on Friday afternoon. I feel like I have this kinship with y'all. Like you're my Friday afternoon pals. Okay, so anyway, you need to know your history, right? Did Newton believe light was a wave because of reflection? No, he believed it was a particle because of reflection. Did Einstein believe light was a particle because of a photoelectric effect? Yeah, right. Huygens wave because of refraction? Yes, that's why he believed light was a wave because of refraction. And Young believed light was a particle because of the double slit experiment or the interference of light. We'll get to this soon. But because of interference, did he believe light was a particle? No. He believed light was a wave because of the double slit experiment which showed interference. Uh, they have covered that at this point. So the answer is uh, what? 2 and 3. A. 
Uh, if you have a material with an index of refraction of 1.5, how do you find the speed of light? Well, I say that uh, the speed of light C, or excuse me, V is equal to uh, C divided by N. That's based on our index of refraction. And so I say 3 times 10 to the 8 over 1.5 or 2 times 10 to the 8. So the answer would be E right there. Uh, total internal reflection. We just saw that today. We just sort of barely brushed on it. But total internal reflection is just a special case of the law of refraction where theta 2 is equal to 90. So N1 sine theta 1 equals N2 sine of 90 degrees. And so this just goes away. This is equal to 1. And so I want to know um, what is the incident angle. It's also called the critical angle. And so I sine a theta 1 equals N2 over N1. It's traveling from glass to air. Glass, air, traveling in this direction. So this is my N1, this is my N2. So theta 1 is the inverse sine of uh, 1.5 over 1. And it, it is what it is. I, I'm not sure. 37 maybe? Emily, you're my go-to first. What's, what's that? The inverse sine of 1.5. Somebody else got it? It's okay. Yeah, 1.5 over 1, the inverse sign of that. Oh, uh, did I get it wrong? Oh, I did it wrong. It should be 1 over 1.5. Sorry, what's 1 over 1.5, the inverse sign of that? Okay, so 42 degrees. But I'm glad that we did it wrong because what happens, we'll cover this next time in class, but what happens if instead of going from glass to air, I go from air to class. Hmm. You get a domain error, right? Like when she tried to put that in, she got a domain error. That's because total internal reflection must go from a high index of refraction to a low index of refraction. The reason is, is that the light ray must always bend towards the normal. But if I'm going from air to glass, it's going to bend away from the normal. Or excuse me, I said that incorrectly. For total internal reflection to occur, it has to bend away from the normal. It goes up here and it bends down, so it doesn't actually leave the medium. But if you're going from a low index to a high index, you're going to move towards the normal. If I'm going from air to glass, I'll get a light ray come in, and then it's going to bend in that direction, which is the wrong direction for total internal reflection. We'll see that again on Monday. We're going to explore TIR just a little bit more. Okay? Any questions? I'm sorry, we didn't brush on OpenStack. Um, if you have questions about OpenStack, please come see me. Now, if you're uncertain about your answers, come show me your work, and I will answer your questions. Do not get a poor grade on because come see me, I'll help you. Okay, I want to make a hundred percent on those assignments. Hundred percent, nothing less than hundred percent. Okay, it's a test. Test. All right, come see me before you leave.